Hey guys, it's Kerry with the Walking on the Boulevard podcast. I hope you guys are doing good out there in Elvis land. I have some sad news to announce. Last night, um, it's today is February 5th or the 6th. Crap, I don't have my phone on me. So Anyway, it's February. Last night, I got the sad news that um, Elvis's friend and Memphis legend, George Klein, had passed away. He had been sick for he'd been sick for a good little while, and uh, the last uh, few three or four days, I'd heard that hospice had been contacted. Uh, Marion Cock, one of Elvis's nurses, she had been posting updates on her Facebook page. So we all kind of, I guess, kind of knew that it was coming. We were just hoping that you know something would happen and he would get better. Yeah, uh, but he was—he's uh, one of the last left. There's not that many people that you know either worked with Elvis or grew up with Elvis that are still around. Uh, George Klein, I believe he was 83 years old. And he had been, you know, he's been working since he was a kid, and he was still working up until recently. He was still working. Um, if you if you had an opportunity to come to Memphis any time in the, oh, over a decade, decade and a half, maybe even longer, then I'm sure you, even if you didn't realize it, you probably passed right by him. He, uh, he used to to do a radio show in the Sirius booth over at the old Graceland Plaza, which was located right across the street from Graceland. They had a, I know if you go now, it's completely different. They've knocked that whole uh, shopping center down and put green grass there. And, you know, behind there, they built that new complex. But prior to, I like two years ago, you had uh, a shopping center that had been there since Elvis was alive. And in the center, they had a, they had set up a serious booth. That, I'm not exactly sure when it came. I'm thinking maybe 2004, 2005, something like that. Maybe even a little sooner, earlier, earlier than that. But George Klein, he was kind of the draw, I guess, to begin the early days. Anyway, they had him his show on there, and he would interview a lot of the people who knew Elvis and worked with Elvis in the movies or recorded with him, that kind of stuff. And I used to love it. Go over there. I used to I used to only go two or three times a year. I would go for the birthday celebration in January. I would go for Elvis week in August. And then sometimes I might come for a short trip, maybe in April or May, just to, just to get away. And I would always go over. He had a, I believe he had an evening show. It may have even been on Fridays. I can't remember now. It's been so long. But I would go over there and stand outside the booth, snap photos, uh, record a little bit on my, on my camera, and just listen to him because he had a, a ton of really interesting stories to tell. And uh, it's gonna, you know, once they knocked that whole thing down in 2016 or seven, no, I guess it was 2017. They finally knocked it down, but they, they had, uh, I guess they, I think they closed it down maybe at the end of 2016, something like that, and then they moved it into the new complex, which opened. Gosh, my memory is terrible. I'm thinking it was March of 2017, I believe, is when the new complex opened. So they moved it in there, but now it's. It's it's not it's not as accessible as it used to be. It used to be anyone could go through the Graceland Plaza and you could just stop. The booth was right there out in the open. You could just stop and listen to um, George Klein or Jim Sykes or Argo or whoever it happened to be on at that time. You could just go stand over there and listen to them and watch them through the windows. But now they've put it in the pay part of the new complex. So in order to see them, you have to you know purchase the day pass to go back there. Anyway, um, I, I had the opportunity to, I mean, I met the guy a million times. He was very accessible. He was really friendly with fans. If you went over to the to the booth and watched him, once he would go to commercial break, he would come outside, shake hands, take pictures, sign autographs, whatever. So I met him a whole bunch of times. But then um, I'm, I'm thinking it was maybe 2004, 2005. I'm not exactly sure on the dates here, but I know it was a long time ago because I shot it with my Hi8 camera, which was a really crappy old camera um and that that's how i can kind of date it because i haven't used that camera in forever but uh anyway i i went back there and i, I he was his show was was ending so he was getting ready to leave and i, I said hi to him and asked him if i could ask him a couple of questions and get him to record a message for my mother he was like sure it was really really cold it was in january so he invited me into the booth so i actually recorded this little bitty small bit in the booth i haven't been able to find that yet it was so long ago but it's it's somewhere on one of my many many hard drives if not i've still got all my tapes uh but then and i believe it was 2006 i came back over there or it even it could have even been later and i think it was 2006 i went back over there 
and he was ending his show and getting ready to leave, and I stopped and I asked him if I could do a short interview with him for walking on the boulevard, and he was like, sure, no problem, and he and it was about to start raining, so he he said, let's just do it in the shop, and at this at this time, they didn't used to hassle you if you you know, shots, film stuff over there. They, you know, you could walk around with camcorders. Nobody ever really said anything to you, except when you went inside. I, we discovered this. We went in there. I asked him um, about his first meeting Elvis, and he got about 30 seconds into it, and you hear a, an employee go, Sir, you can't film in here. You're going to have to step outside. So we stepped outside, and we went underneath the canopy that was, uh, I think it was a canopy, in front of the Sirius booth, and we recorded our first interview. I'm going I'm to start off with uh, a quick clip. This this first clip I'm going to show, I'm trying to do these in kind of a, an order. So I did another interview with him for my documentary 816, which, and we did that in 2013, right after I had done a, a, a sneak peek screening of the film. It was still a rough cut, and I was looking to add some new stuff, so I, I met up with him again. And asked him to do another interview. Told him about my documentary. He was like, absolutely. So we stepped over. And that, this, we did this one in the parking lot next to the Sirius booth. And this one was mostly about the end of Elvis's life. But we did briefly touch on the on the beginning. So this first clip I'm going to do is going to be talking about his background. And I'm going to go straight in to a clip from, my, from the 2006 interview of him meeting Elvis. And you're going to notice a little bit of rain because we were, it was starting to rain as we were doing that interview. So check out these two clips. My name is George Klein. I'm a Memphis, Tennessee uh, radio and TV guy. <laughs> Just jockey for a million years here in Memphis and have a TV show now called Memphis Sounds with George Klein. And uh, Elvis and I met in high school in the eighth grade. It was a music class. And... Uh, Christmas was approaching, and the teacher said instead of studying music lessons next week, we're going to do Christmas carols. And Elvis asked the teacher if he could bring his guitar to school and sing, and she said, yeah, and he got up in front of the class that day, the next week, and he sang two songs. He sang Cold Cold Icy Fingers, and he uh, sang Old Shep. And uh, I was totally impressed, and that was a bonding where I met Elvis, and we went all the way through high school, the same exact grades. I became senior class president and uh, got out of high school and I started working in radio and TV in Memphis. He started recording and traveled with him for a year before he went in the Army. And I was in eight of his movies, little bitty parts, minor parts, what they call silent bits or something to that effect. And then when he went in the Army, I went back into radio and television. And uh, when he got married, I was a groomsman at his wedding. When I got married, uh, he was the best man at my wedding. And when he passed away, I was uh, one of the pallbearers at his funeral. Uh, yeah, it was 1948, uh, Humes High School in Memphis, Tennessee, Elvis moved up from Tupelo and uh, coincidentally he entered our high school and we were in the exact same classes all the way through the 8th to the 12th grade. And I'll never forget when I really first met Elvis was an 8th grade music class. It was uh, Christmas time and Elvis brought his guitar to school to sing to the class and I, I couldn't believe it, you know, that well, that uh, guy was bringing his guitar at 12 years old and singing to the class. And uh, he totally impressed me, sang a couple of country songs. And after that, we bonded and became very good friends. And uh, all the way through high school, I became class president our senior year. And uh, there were just wonder many wonderful memories from those high school days. And after high school, I went into radio and television. And Elvis started recording for Sun Records, and we became even closer. And there was a, uh, there, there was a, a year uh, before Elvis went in the Army, I actually worked for him. Uh, from 1957 to 58, I was on his payroll and traveled with him with all of the country. Went to Hawaii and Canada, went to Hollywood when he made the movie Jailhouse Rock. And when he went in the Army, I went back into radio and television. And after uh, he got out of the Army, he tried to hire me back, he wanted to hire me back to travel with him. But I said, Elvis, I said, I, uh, I'm already established in Memphis Radio and TV and I hate to give it up. He said, oh, I don't blame you. He said, just do what you're doing and whenever you want to travel with me, just let me know there'll always be a place for you. And uh, Consequently, I would travel with him, whether he was making a movie or whether he was on tour, whether he was playing Vegas or what have you. And it was a, a lot of wonder, wonderful memories. He was a great guy. Uh, he had, was just a, a real terrific friend. You couldn't have a better friend, a more generous guy. And he, he was always doing things for his friends. He loved to help you out if you were in time of need. And all he ever wanted back in return was loyalty. He really was uh, a terrific person. Every year at Elvis Week, George would host um, a, a meetup with fans 
I, I did this in the early days, but it's been forever since I got to to do it again. He would you know go out there, he meet fans, and tell stories about his life with Elvis. Because you know he went to not only did he go to school with Elvis, they became friends, and then he was doing you know his radio shows in Memphis uh, for years and years and years. But he would also still pal around with Elvis, and even he even mentioned that he did some you know bit roles in some of Elvis's films. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I was looking on the on the Wikipedia page, and I got a little bit of information that I I wasn't aware of. In 2013, George Klein was. Uh, elected into the Tennessee Radio Hall of Fame. And then in 2018, he was elected into the Memphis Music Hall of Fame. So so that's really cool. He deserved to be in there because he is his own Memphis legend. Uh, he, he, you know, I, I like the Memphis Mafia. I know a lot of people don't like the Memphis Mafia. They just think of them as hangers-on. But And you, maybe you could say that about certain members but with George Klein, while he was a member of the Memphis Mafia and he was a friend of Elvis's, he also had his own thing. He he was a you know he did radio forever. I think he started in 1957 and he was still doing it. In fact, um, in January of 2018, I was over in the the pay side of the new Elvis Presley's Memphis complex with my friend Colin Paul and uh, Jim Sykes who's one of the the DJs there. I believe that's his name. I'm terrible with names. Hopefully I'm getting this right. Big Jim Sykes, I think is what he's called. Anyway, he uh, flagged Colin down and asked him to come on on the radio. So they invited both of us back in there. So I got to go stand in there. And George Klein is sitting there doing the the radio show with him. This is probably towards the end of his time on radio. Uh, It was during the birthday celebration. Colin was on there for four or five minutes. I snapped some some shots with my camera. And um, I, I, I even... I even recorded a little bit of the audio just because I wanted it on there. And then afterwards, we got to talk to George again and snap some photos with him. He was he was a really nice guy. I I have nothing negative to say about George. I've you know, I've heard I've heard people you know people say this or that about different people associated with Elvis, but I got to say from my own experiences, um, I never witnessed anything negative. It was all positive. He always took time for fans, even when he would be tired. I mean, the thing about the guy, the guy was 83 years old, and but he was still working. He was still doing events, but even though he, he would do this event for four or five hours and be really tired and probably want to go home and take a nap, uh, he would still stop. If a fan said, can I take a picture with you? Of course you can. Can I ask you a question about Elvis? Sure you can. Would you sign this? Absolutely. He was never, I never ever saw him say no, and a lot of times people wouldn't even be you know, they'd be standing over there watching his show. They wouldn't even be asking him to come out. He would just see them and the, go to commercial, and he'd just get up and walk out and say, hey, hey, where are you guys from? That kind of stuff. In fact, if you go to my YouTube page, Walking on the Boulevard, um, or Outlaw Films, one of the two. There's two different different pages. Uh, one of them, I, I shot a lot of little B-roll of him greeting fans outside of Sirius Booth. And I think it was 2013. I think it was the day that we did our, our final interview. But I, I want to... To cut to another interview clip real quick, this one, this is another two interview clips I'm putting together. Um, in 2013, I had asked him about Elvis's generosity because if you if you're an Elvis fan, I'm sure you've heard the stories about how Elvis was always buying extravagant gifts for you know this person or that person, even if he didn't know them. So a lot of times it would be people he knew, but at the same time, if, if he met somebody and he felt like they needed this or he wanted them to have this item he'd just buy it for him didn't matter if he was friends with him didn't matter if he had never heard of him if he wanted to buy it he'd buy it well here's a, jo- a clip from my 2013 interview with george klein talking about ellis's generosity and we're going to go straight from that into a clip from my 2006 interview which is a similar type question only this one he's talking about cars that he purchased so check it out yeah Elvis was generous to a fault i mean man he'd give you the shirt off his back uh, he was just so, if he, he said, Elvis, that's a beautiful ring. Well, let me see your ring. I'll swap with you. He, uh, he said, Elvis, what a wonderful watch. He said, you want it? And he gave it to you. You know, and then he gave away, he must have given away over a couple hundred cars over his career. And uh, he was just very generous and he was very uh, charity minded. He was just a great guy. Yeah, well, Elvis gave me two cars. He gave me a 68 and a 73 Cadillac. And then uh, one time he was uh, actually, when he was buying a Cadillac for himself one Christmas, there was an African-American couple there, and uh, 
Elvis said, are you guys buying a new car for Christmas? And they said, oh no, Mr. Presley, we, uh, we're just window shopping. And he said, well, if you could afford a car, which one would you get? And they said, oh, that one right over there. He told the, the salesperson, he said, put that on my tab. He said, Merry Christmas. Unbelievable. Yeah, this particular episode uh, of my podcast isn't going to have a lot of music. It's still going to have the, the regular closing number can't help falling in love by brian clark but i'm not i don't i don't know what songs george klein was in so i'm not really gonna you know i'm not gonna put any music in because i just don't know what i don't know what he was into i never asked him that question unfortunately i wish i had gotten the chance to sit down and do like a really long interview with him that would have been really cool but um i i posted a thing briefly on my a little while ago on my facebook page i didn't have a lot of advance notice because i i found out that george had passed away last night before I went to bed, and I decided to do a podcast today. I didn't get a chance to really to put that information out there for so for people to be able to participate. So uh, I just put it. I put a thing up there saying I was going to do this. If you wanted to share a memory, put it below, and I would read it online. Um, so it, one person has responded so far, so I'm going to read hers. I ho- I'm sure other people are going to respond later, but unfortunately I wanted to get this out as quick as possible, so I had to just jump on it. This memory is from Sue Denny Pointer. She says, When I met George in 2014, he told me I had beautiful eyes and they looked just like Elvis' eyes. I absolutely love listening to him on Elvis Radio. I will miss him so much. I regret that I didn't get him to sign his book that I bought, but forgot to take it with me that day. Oh, that that stinks. That's unfortunate. He would have signed it. He would have signed anything. I mean, he used to hand out. He used to do something. I guess he spoke. Did uh, I don't know? Maybe maybe he was a guest or something at one of the casinos. But he would every time I met him, he would hand me a one of his business cards from the casino, and he had signed them all. Um, I got him to sign an Elvis scarf. There's a gift shop that's uh, next next to Graceland. It's called Boulevard Souvenirs, and they used to sell these white Elvis. They're, they're kind of like handkerchief head, headband type things. But anyway, I got I got him to sign one of those years ago, and I put it in a frame. Um, I got him to sign a whole bunch of stuff. In fact, the last time I remember having a conversation with him was, uh, or uh, other than hi and i took that picture with him in january but I, I i saw him at a guest house event i think it was last year and he was heading for the door people kept stopping him to take pictures and sign autographs or whatever so i too i had had some kind of little flyer about the weekend's events and i was getting all the elvis people to sign it so i, I stuck it out there for him and he all he had was a pen that he was signing everybody's thing and i had a sharpie on me I always carry one with me to events for autographs so i handed him my sharpie he signed mine and then was like thanks a lot buddy or something like that and left and didn't give me my sharpie back uh, so uh, I never forgot that. I thought it was funny. But he probably didn't even think about it. But anyway, um, the next thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play for you is a clip from 2013. He, uh, Like Sue Denny had just mentioned him talking about his book uh, or, or her wanting to get him to sign her book. Here it is. Him Here's him talking about the release of his book. Check it out. Yeah, my book just came out this past year, Carrie, and it's called Elvis, My Best Man. And it's uh, for sale. Uh, if your bookstore doesn't have it, you can call it off the internet. Just go to Amazon.com. The book is doing very well for me. Uh, it's in about 6th or 7th printing. It's overseas in Germany, in German. It's in England. And uh, it's called, uh, actually, My Life with Elvis and uh, through high school and things I've just told you. A lot bit more in detail in the book. It's a really good book. It went number one in America on Kindle. And I'm very proud of the book. When I decided that I was going to do this podcast, I called my buddy and... Um, frequent co-host Colin Paul contacted him on, on Facebook and asked him if he would like to share a memory because he spent a lot of time with George too, um, not just um, not just during Elvis week, but he he met up with him on some other, on some other occasions. So here here's a, a memory, a thing of memories he sent to me. So check it out. Well, I'm sat here today at my home in England and absolutely devastated by the great loss of George Klein, old GK himself. I've known George many many years and have some great memories of, of meeting George over the years always a gentleman always that great guy with real southern hospitality I mean you hear this about people anyway but this guy had it by the by the shovel full you know he uh, he just oozed um, great southern hospitality and and, and 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 oozed his love for Elvis you know it shone through with everything that he ever said about Elvis and 
the stories that I used to tell everybody about Elvis, you could see the love in his eyes. And I, I certainly think that out of all of them, uh, he loved Elvis the most. I, I'm sure all the other guys loved him too, but uh, there was just some connection with George and Elvis that uh, is second to none really as far as Elvis's buddies are concerned. I think my biggest memory of, of George is spending three or four days with him in Germany and uh, we hung out a lot and he read from his book to me. He was really pleased and, and proud of his book and so he should be and we even visited a, a, a few Christmas markets while we were over in Germany and had a few drinks um, although George wouldn't drink the, the mulled wine not quite like I did anyway he, he preferred a hot cup of tea so wherever we went we'd stop at every cafe on the way just so George could have his hot cup of tea um, great memories, great times and feeling absolutely devastated today and uh, long may his, his memory continue to, to grow and, and, and prosper on all of us the main reason that I I got with him in 2013 to do the interview was that I wanted to fill in some gaps for my documentary 816, which dealt with the effect that Elvis's death had on his fans. But I wanted to get some of the timelines set straight. I wanted to know what some of the stuff that was happening behind the scenes and that kind of stuff. So I, I talked to him about the um, those few days that were going on. And this first clip that I'm going to play is actually from the 2006 interview. It leads into the 2013 one. It's him talking about the last time that he saw Elvis alive. And we go straight into him finding out that Elvis had passed away. And then we're going to conclude this episode with um, another clip of him talking about the funeral procession. So I appreciate you guys checking out this podcast. I'm sorry that it didn't have more music in it. I'll add more music on the next one. But like I said, I just had no idea what kind of music, which, which kind of Elvis songs that George liked. So I didn't want to put anything in here. So anyway, thanks a lot for listening to this. George, we'll miss you. Thanks for all you've done for the Elvis world. Take care, guys. Last time I saw Elvis alive was about three days before he passed away. I came up to Graceland to visit with Elvis, talked to him about a personal matter. We went up in his bedroom and had a great talk, and uh, he told me he was getting ready to go on tour, and I told him what I was doing at that time, and, and three days later he passed away. I was uh, ready on TV in Memphis, but I was freelancing for a theme park called Liberty Land, and I got a call, and they said, uh, the radio station call said, GK, uh, we just got a bulletin from United Press that Elvis has passed away. And I said, oh, I don't believe that. You know, a couple of weeks ago that happened. He was in a hospital and he got a bulletin and it wasn't for real. They said, well, can you check it out? Well, uh, no sooner than I hung that phone up, I had five more calls there. They were all for me. And I, every one of them was asking me about that. So I took one of the phones off the hook and I, I called Graceland and I got uh, Mr. Presley's girlfriend, Sandy, on the phone. I said, Sandy, this is George Klein. Is it true about Elvis? She said, yes. And you need to get out here as fast as you can. And man, I was I was in a state of shock right there. And I couldn't walk, couldn't say anything, couldn't talk. So I went out and jumped in my car and drove uh, 100 miles an hour to Graceland. Walked in and Mr. Presley was there. And there was turmoil in the little uh, room off the kitchen. And uh, everybody was crying and hugging each other. And you just couldn't believe it. And uh, Mr. Presley said, George, we've lost him. And I said, help Mr. Presley. I said, uh, you know, maybe it's a mistake. Maybe uh, they pulled him through by the grace of God. He said, so about that time, Dr. Nick walked in, the doctor. He said, would you all gather around me? We gather around Dr. Nick. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to tell you that Elvis Presley passed away this afternoon. There were, there were I think there were 16 white limousines. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we went down to the Forest Hill Cemetery, which is about, uh, uh, oh, about seven or eight miles north of Graceland. Oh, yeah, north of Graceland. And they were lined up and down the highways, two or three deep. People listening on transistor radios to the news and watching us, and they were waving and blowing kisses and all. It was a very, uh, very moving situation for me. I'd like to tell you something fantastic, but I'd like to do this song especially for Blue Hawaii.